All right, so uh, we are InfoScout. My name is John, CTO, co-founder of InfoScout. Uh, what I'll be talking about here is a little bit about us. You've probably never heard of InfoScout, so I'll give you a little bit about what we're doing. Uh, dive into our architecture, then we'll do kind of a deep dive into one part of our architecture, which is all around transcribing receipts. Uh, and then I'll dive into Mechanical Turk, which is probably why you're really here, to talk pros and cons, quality control, uh, what's worked for us, how do you manage your workforce, what analytics do you look at, uh, and finally, kind of give you a sneak peek of what we got coming at InfoScout, kind of at the end result of all this data. So InfoScout, we are uh, SF Series A funded startup, 15 employees, stealth-ish, probably haven't heard of us quite yet. Uh, and our mission is really just to make brands better marketers. Uh, we focus on what we call real world analytics, and that's really just kind of measuring the offline world. It's what people purchase and consume kind of in the brick and mortar world. So, you know, if you sell any products across America or the world, um, most people assume that, you know, the Procter and Gambles of the world and everything have full, full visibility into every product and the households that are purchasing them and why they're purchasing them. But the reality is all that data they get back from the retailers is actually just a small window of really all the purchasing that's going on. Um, they largely just get back that I sold this many units at this store in this day. Uh, you can think of like if you sell something on Amazon.com, I mean, it's nice to know that you sold 500 units today, but it's a lot nicer to know who bought them, what they buy them with, why they buy them, et cetera. So we're really here to answer and help brands and, and other audiences really figure out who's buying their product um, down to the individual level, down to the basket level. What's their motivation? When did they buy it? How did they buy it? Why did they buy it, et cetera. So the question is, how do you get that data and how you do that? Um, so today, this is an industry that's largely dominated by Nielsen. Um, most people think Nielsen, you might think TV ratings, online ratings, radio ratings. So that whole segment is about one third of their business. Um, the other two thirds of Nielsen is really, they just track what people buy in America. Uh, and believe it or not, one of the primary data sources, how they get that today, is they send 50 to 75,000 barcode scanners into the US, into households in the US and ask those households after every trip to spend the 10 to 15 minutes and scan in every single product. Um, as you can imagine, quite time consuming. It's 2013, there's gotta be a better way than that. Everyone's carrying around a smartphone. So the whole notion and concept of InfoScout is we can get a better pulse of what people are doing and purchasing in America by simply just asking them on their smartphone to snap a photo of their receipt. We have a couple mobile apps out in both iOS and um, Google, and it's effectively just two mobile apps that, at the end of the day, incentivize the user just to, once they're done shopping, pull out your phone, snap a picture of your receipt, and that's it. So, comparative to maybe the Nielsen solution, which might take 10, 15 minutes, uh, the approach here is this should be a 15, 20 second task. You're done, you're gone. Um, we have an app called Receipt Hog, Feel free to download it. Uh, you can, you know, it's a fun game, you know, kind of has a layer of game mechanics where you have a pig, Tamagotchi style, you feed him receipts, he gets bigger, and you, you can effectively cash out. Uh, the second app we have is called Shopperoo, and it's really all focused around collective fundraising. Um, there's a much different motivation for putting $30 to $40 a year in your pocket rather than collectively for 100 people, you know, raising $2,000, $3,000. Uh, I was wondering, like when you said they uh, they send household the barcode scanners yep. uh, or you know this app, like I'm trying to understand, like if they really want to collect the data, can they not just like you know the, when you are checking out, yeah. that's it's already tracking. Yeah, you. right. That's a that's a quite common question. Is how is this still happening in 2013? The retailers got the data, and the answer is that the retailer really has that data. They don't share that level of granularity back to the brands. Um, if you think about a parallel in the online world, that'd be like going to Amazon and be like, hey, let me see every visitor you have, where they go on the web, everything like that. Amazon's like, no, 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 that's, that's ours to keep, right? So, well, Safeway knows everything you do, and probably everyone's heard that story about Target, the girl, you know, Target figured out she was pregnant before she did. Like, the retailers know that. It's the brands who have a lot less visibility into that data. Well, yeah, and they want to hold that data. So, I mean, that's, that's theirs to keep. Um, there was a little asterisk to that. Kroger actually does resell that through a company called Dunhumby. Uh, but largely, that level of granularity, that household basket level, stays within the confines of the retailer. 
So we'll dive into a bit of our architecture here. Um, so it all starts with the user capturing the receipt. Uh, clearly, we try and do everything we can on their mobile device to ensure high accuracy. Uh, we use the accelerometer. Uh, we have a lot of tool tips and validation and other things. So receipt comes into our system and our server. And effectively, the first step is we got to convert this to structured data, uh, JSON, if you will. Uh, so that right now, this is a hybrid of computer vision, OCR, and Mechanical Turk that does this. Uh, we'll be diving mostly into the kind of this step of our architecture. So great, you got all the structured data, you were able to digitize the receipt. Well, it's only really valuable if you can actually map that to all the products and master data out the, in the world. So take the example here, user shops at Safeway, they buy a product, GA2, G2, Lemon, Lime. Well, we need to be able to map that to a UPC, to a brand, to a category, tag and cleanse and categorize it. So that part of our architecture, we go and scrape a lot of websites throughout the web, we buy a lot of data sources, we clean it, we tag it, uh, use a lot of classification models, TDIDF and other things, in order to be able to map all the data that's on the receipt to actual master data. Then it's a matter of getting in, in any kind of data format, it's easily to query and use. Um, and then the next part of the architecture is a lot of pre materialization and some Hadoop work to try and just pull all that data into MySQL so we can analyze and evaluate it. And finally, just we get to build all the cool stuff on top of it. Um, that it's a bit what I will show you later. So again, we're going to be diving into kind of this part. And this is, this is a big part of our architecture, again, where we just take the images of the receipt, and the goal is to get structured data out. So sometimes the receipt's nice and clean and easy. And again, this is the goal for this part of the architecture. You see the receipt on the left, the JSON on the right. But users are fun. Sometimes it's nice, fun, wrinkly receipts. Sometimes it's very, very blurry receipts. Sometimes the user draws the receipt, it, try and, uh, since it is a gamified. And sometimes you get an ass crack. So. <laughs> This was my friend when we were prototyping. He didn't think we were looking at the images, but he didn't know his ass crack was going to be shown to 200 people. <laughs> All right, so digitizing receipts. Um, so this is largely a hybrid of everything we can do algorithmically and then filling in the gaps with Mechanical Turk. So on the algorithmic side, we use OpenCV and computer vision to try and use feature detection to pull out the logo, which we can do with quite high accuracy. Um, OCR, a lot of people think OCR is solved, it's good, it's great. Um, it's solved for books and paragraphs and clean text you scan in. Uh, not so much for photos taking of a receipt off a mobile device, some multiple angles and, and contrast and wrinkle, and et cetera. Uh, we do OCR and we do do a lot of kind of regex engines on top of the OCR text to try and pull out what we can. But it, it's far from a solved process for us and that's the, that's the need for Mechanical Turk. And then on the human side, um, again, it's, it's vastly Mechanical Turk. We also have a team of four people abroad that kind of act as our top layer on top of all our Mechanical Turk. Um, that's the strategy we have now. Uh, in order to scale this out, which I'll talk about, is various strategies within mTurk to kind of leverage workers to help audit the workers and scale this out. So we can, today we're processing around 20,000 receipts a day. What happens when we're doing 100 or 150,000 receipts a day? Ah, Mechanical Turk. Um, pop quiz. Anyone know where they got the name Mechanical Turk? Do you know? Do you know? Yeah. Go for it. Uh, I believe it's a reference to an old uh, Yeah, that's right. So back in the 1700s, they had this sweet, like, uh, big chess board that was completely automated, and they would travel around the world, and it was supposed to be completely programmatic, and it beat the likes of Napoleon and Ben Franklin. Well, it turns out the entire time, it was all an optical illusion, and there was actually a little person inside at this chess machine. So, thus, the name Mechanical Turk. A little food for thought. Was it a Turk? What? <laughs> Interesting. Good to know. So Mechanical Turk, uh, there's a lot of crowdsourcing um, 
options out there. There's a lot of platforms. Uh, at a very high level, what is Mechanical Turk and how is it different from the others? Uh, at the very, you know, one of the biggest pros of Mechanical Turk is massive worker volume, uh, and therefore it's generally fast and economical. Uh, a very clean programmatic interface, and uh, it's backed by Amazon, obviously a very trusted and established, and it's not a startup that might disappear in a year or two. You know, I think a lot of people I talk to go and use them Turk and maybe walk away a week later a bit frustrated. They publish 200 tasks and they're like, 15 were wrong and all upset. And while that's true, I mean, I think it, you, it is a complete, just very primitive data sourcing, crowdsourcing platform. Um, so therefore, at times you get lower quality and lower skill sets. Uh, with the right quality control strategies, you can, you can achieve pretty high accuracy. And I will say the API, it's, it, it's primitive. Uh, it takes you a little bit to kind of wrap your head around it and all the terms used. And um, all these strategies I'll talk about are largely not bundled into the API. You kind of have to develop those yourself. Quick little MTurk 101, um, just so I don't lose you. Uh, I'll be dropping the term hit often. Uh, HIT is just a human intelligible task for anyone who's not familiar. It's basically just a piece of work to get done. Um, and then basically just really quick, Mechanical Turk, uh, crowdsourcing platform. You can publish HITs via, they have an online solution. You can upload via batch or they have a programmatic solution uh, through API. Uh, you can render the HITs either through one of their predefined templates or what most, it seems most workers do is uh, basically an iframe. So you host the, the, the work yourself. Uh, and finally, auditing. You know, is this hit correct? Do you approve or reject it? And how do you handle that? You can do that from online or API as well. So again, a lot of quality control strategies. Uh, I'll touch on a number of them and dive into kind of the ones we use, how we use them, and what's been successful for us. Uh, I've grouped them into kind of from the top down is, at the very least, you can filter people who come into uh, to, to complete your tasks. And then there's a lot that can be done while they're completing their tasks to really achieve uh, high quality control, which I'll show you. And then post submission. Worker did the task, did they do it right? Uh, there's a lot of ways to, to, a lot of strategies you can use, whether it be plurality, having multiple uh, workers do one task, uh, using a strategy called note answers. You can use workers to audit other workers. You can hire your own workforce, which is kind of what we've done. Um, so those are some of the uh, kind of post-submission, how do you know the work is good? So qualifications is baked into the entire system in the API. And it's just to, allows you to say, hey, he's, there's the people who can actually complete my work, right? Um, at the, the very basic, they have system qualifications, which I would recommend using for you guys. Uh, it basically, you can limit uh, workers to uh, minimal approval rates, minimal approval counts, so you don't have some brand new worker on the system who's done one hit and is horrible uh, and starts eroding your quality. Um, we currently use uh, 95 and 1,000, so you have to complete 1,000 hits and have a 95% approval rating to complete most of our hits. And Mechanical Turk also has this notion of kind of a master's qualification. You'll find this in some of the other crowdsourcing platforms where they come in and they're gonna actually say, these workers are skilled, we've uh, monitored their input and output, we do ongoing monitoring, and so if you, it's basically just a layer of higher workers. Uh, obviously, it's all a capitalistic system, so therefore better workers generally require to earn a little bit more. Um, and they've, they've designated even a few subcategories, uh, which are just very common use cases on MTurk, which is categorization and photo moderation. Uh, a very common approach is just, uh, you can set up your own test qualification. So you can just give him a test before he starts working on your task. So you can give him an example task. If he does it wrong, he can't work on it. If he does it right, he can work on it. So a pretty simple uh, uh, qualification task. And finally, you can grant them kind of any level of custom qualifications. Um, one strategy we're starting to employ is actually uh, leveraging our top workers. So we have our top tier workers. Take our top workers who completed tens of thousands of uh, tasks with 98% approval rating. Grant them a custom qualification that says, hey, you're an elite InfoScout worker. 
and use them to start auditing our workforce below it. Hit templates, a lot of people kind of just skip past this, but we found the most improvement in terms of quality control of just building good templates uh, and iterating on them and tweaking on them. Um, I mean, a lot of it goes without saying, but uh, very, I mean, I, you, you've got to keep in mind like the workforce, so you have to be overly, overly explicit with them. Um, one thing we've done is really spell out and be extremely explicit, and then give them the option after they've done a one or two, just to get rid of all the instructions so they can go, right? So a lot of it's just being very, very explicit early on, and then once they've got it, they can hide it and go. For us, we've done a lot. We're doing more around keyboard shortcuts. The user never has to hit the mouse. They can work faster. You can do cheaper hits. And a lot around validation as well. Um, I'll jump around. We did a huge, it's a huge improvement for us when we show you an example of some of our hits here. So here's a hit we've done where we're asking the user to itemize every single uh, item on the receipt, right? Um, keep in mind, the workers and you are pretty much on the same page, right? They, they want to be rewarded for the hit. They don't want to be rejected. They take their approval rating very, very seriously. And so the more you can do to ensure that they're doing it right, the better. So for example, um, we, we've done a lot now around kind of Ajax validation where we'll send the entire result back to our server, run it through, check for a bunch of things in terms of comparing what they've entered to what's on the OCR. Um, does everything they enter kind of add up? And if they're wrong, we'll warn them. We won't, they can still submit the hit, but after we implemented this, our you know, rejection ratings on our, what we call our de-itemized extraction went from 5% uh, to about 3%. So it was one of our bigger uh, improvements just doing this. So I can give you an example. I'm just gonna enter one item here and go down. And that just went, hit our server, and we say, wait a minute, this doesn't look right. Um, this is actually the same layer of logic we use once we're done to try and prioritize how do we audit the workers. So something looks wrong here. We're going to prompt the workers ahead of time and allow them to fix it. Finally, the, the one up for us, it's a big deal, and for a lot of hits where you have a kind of variable um, length and commitment time to complete the hit. So we have some receipts where there's two items, some receipts where there's 100 items, right? Uh, we can't charge the same reward for all, or everyone's just going to skip the 100 item receipts. Uh, so Mechanical Turk does allow you to offer the ability to kind of bonus workers. Once they submit it, you can evaluate their response. Uh, in our case, it's simply looking and we, we communicate that, this with them that they get an extra cent for every 10, 10 items they do. So many times you have hits with kind of variable length and commitment, the bonus works well. So this is a strategy that we are implementing here very shortly. Uh, it's called a known answer strategy. And, and it works quite well when you have a hit task where there's very clearly defined kind of input and output. Um, multiple choice answers would be a great example of this. So in this example template to the right, which we're, we're about to prototype and release, is the user has uh, four receipts in front of them. They have to enter the total, transaction date, et cetera. One of those is just put, put in there and we know the input output. So we can take the response back and say, hey, receipt number three, we've already known the input and output this. Is this correct? And then we can, you know, um, decide appropriately if, if that's correct, we just decide to auto approve or what have you. And this is actually baked in a bit to the Amazon API. So you can have Amazon say, they'll keep track of your known answer ranking. And once it hits a certain threshold, you can have them blocked or what have you. I get this question a lot when working on MTurk. Everyone's like, well, can't you just have multiple people do it, right? Uh, it's so cheap, and that is a strategy. It's what kind of call plurality. Uh, for us, we can't afford to do that at our volume on every single receipt. Um, Mechanical Turk is a really large expense for given the amount of volume we do. Um, however, we are starting to do that uh, based on when it comes back, going through some of that same logic is 
if this looks incorrect, instead of sending it to our audit workforce, we're now just gonna start sending it to another MTurk worker to do. It's cheaper for us to do and it allows us to scale out larger. So again, plurality is this notion that you can open up your hit to more than one worker, two people do it, compare the answers. If it's great, accept it. If not, you have a few strategies. One, you could release it to a third worker of an elite qualification and then compare the answer. You can send it to your own workforce to approve or reject. Uh, but it's this whole notion that you have more than one person do the task. We're gonna dig into some of our own analytics and what we've seen um, just working with the system of the past year. Um, one, of the, one of the analytics we look at regularly is the time from hit some, uh, creation to actually hit acceptance and submission. We kind of view this as a pulse of our, uh, the amount of demand we have for our hits in our workforce. So you can see at the bottom here, we average anywhere, you know, it's about 15 to 20 minutes. By the time we submit something out to Mechanical Turk, we get an answer back, right? So we did some major ch template uh, design and candidly added a number of questions to the template. Uh, and all of a sudden, boom, we were like, oh, there's no more demand for our hits, what's going on? Well, it turns out the workforce, eventually new workers came in and everyone was okay with it and excited about it and it came back down. Um, you might also see this various pattern we saw it before early last year uh, when we decreased the hit reward. Here's the same graph, but by time of day. Um, as you can see, between the hours about 1900 to 0300 GMT, uh, that the, the, the demand for our hits uh, goes down quite a bit, and accept, the time to accept goes all the way up to like an hour, two hours. Anyone have any hunch to why that might be? Well, basically, uh, India. yeah, India is sleeping at that time. So uh, I'll dig into it a little bit later, but we're about, uh, right now we're about 70% of our hits are completed um, by India, 29% um, by US, and everyone, 1% everyone else. Um, pretty much Mechanical Turk right now is mostly India and US. Uh, so this is a gauge of basically worker retention. How, <clears throat> the, of all the hits what we release out there, uh, it's, this is probably a similar graph if you have a consumer website, right? Do you get returning users to your website? Uh, it's the same way we monitor our workforce. So you can see the bars represent how many hits we're publishing and being completed on the Mechanical Turk system. So in June, we had almost 600,000 tasks completed. Um, about 95% of those were completed by workers who've been with us for longer than a month. So these are retained workers. Um, one thing we were quite surprised about is very early last year, it didn't take us but a couple months to really build a good workforce where almost 80% of our workforce was returning workers. It's also kind of a testament to how much Mechanical Turk scales. So it's worked out well so far. Here's where we ran into an issue where we basically flooded the system over a day or two with tens of thousands of new hits. So we kind of have a constant level of a workforce, right? So how these workers work is um, they find a couple requesters that they like well. They, they get used to those tasks and every morning they go to mturk.com, log in, find those requesters, and go talk about it on the forums, which I'll get into, and do those over and over and over again. So you kind of have your like level of workforce that exists. And then boom, all of a sudden, you pump four times the amount of volume into the system. And candidly, we were a bit concerned because we, we were doing some back transcription and, and all of a sudden, there were not workers on the other side to complete that right away that we had hoped. Well, it turns out that it just took a little bit of time for more workers to hear about us due to the increased volume. And now when we, if you look at the spikes on the right, which we, what, what, the, what that represents, by the way, is um, for receipts that flow through our system, we don't always itemize every single one. It's, it's, it's quite expensive for us. Uh, we get what we can off the receipt, we do what we can, and then if we feel the data's good, in hindsight, we'll go back and push 50,000, 80,000 through the system again to fully itemize every item. Um, and, and the first time we did that, as you can see at the bottom, 
uh, the latency to accept these hits and our demand for our work went, uh, went down tremendously. It largely wasn't, there was no workers on the other side of that system uh, to pick them up. We built a larger workforce. Now when we flood the system, it's really not, not a big deal. And finally, managing your workforce. Um, if anyone's ever dealt with users, you know how fun users can be. Well, workers can be very fun too. Um, one, one of the things that I, that I think most people don't really realize when doing this is managing your MTurk brand, if you will, is, uh, is just like managing your consumer brand. Uh, having workers that, uh, as you saw on the graph before, you're completely reliant uh, if you have ongoing work on returning workers. So um, having workers that go to you every day and are happy with your work is critical if, if you want to scale and if you're publishing work to Mechanical Turk every day. So it's really a brand in and of its own. Um, two major systems that MTurk uh, workers use and that you kind of need to get involved in is Turk Opticon, which is kind of, it's a browser plugin that most workers, it seems, use, and it's effectively a Yelp for uh, MTurk requesters. And then Turker Nation, which is just the giant MTurk forum. Give you a quick peek. What? So here you go. I'm a worker. I'm looking at all the work to do. I'm like, Scout Analytics, how are they? Ooh, not so good, actually. Um, so they've gotten three reviews, uh, not so good. Crowdsource, uh, very good. And they're a large player, 344 reviews, all very good. So this is just a browser plugin. It's not provided by Mechanical Turk. Uh, it's called Turk Opticon. I'd recommend getting it and keeping an eye on your ratings. Oh, shoot. Sorry, one sec. So a few kind of last tips and tricks I would uh, throw out there just from working on it a while. Um, so the MTurk model is they, uh, they charge 10% or half a cent per hit. Um, one thing I would, if, if at all possible, try to avoid small tasks. Uh, right now, that's something we're working on. We, one of our highest tasks is one cent. And then you can imagine uh, that's effectively a 50% rate that Mechanical Turk's given. So if at all possible, avoid and bundle tasks. Um, Secondly, uh, when you go start publishing them Turks, uh, uh, don't use your real name. Um, it's it's a little bit difficult and, uh, to change. Later. You can change later on. It's not you know it's not hard, but you do lose that brand name. People go in every day and type in Braylick. Thousands of workers do this every day. Um, if you can Google my name slash M Turk, you'll see why. There's a lot of M Turk workers, not all happy, uh, but uh, I would I would use a name. I would use a company name. And, and finally, it's, I mean, it probably goes without saying, but uh, we get a lot of value from Google Analytics. Uh, we use iframes, so we look at that as a pulse to see where they come from. Uh, it's a quick way to get uh, retention and other metrics. Tag your iframe hits with Google Analytics. And from, on, the, on the programmatic side, um, if you're were a Python Django stack, uh, Bodo, I'm sure if anyone in Python worked with AWS before has used it, it's awesome. Uh, Twitter's got a really cool library called Clockwork Raven. I haven't dealt with it as much, but I know people have said good things. And then I'll do a quick, um, so kind of previous to that other architecture, I mentioned we're kind of under the hood, we're stealth. Uh, we've been gathering a lot of data for the past year now. Uh, one of the products we'll be coming out with shortly is, um, kind of think, uh, you guys are probably familiar with Quantcast or Compete. Think that for the offline world. So what are people purchasing, consuming in the offline world? Let's give you a quick peek of uh, what we'll have coming out shortly. Oh, our website. All right, so uh, InfoScout, again, uh, probably looks very similar to Quantcast and Compete, but it's all for the offline world. Um, so you can type any brand or retailer, so we can do Trader Joe's, 
you know, I talked to a lot of people. People think Trader Joe's, oh, it's so cheap, it's so economical. Well, it's, uh, excuse, very, very high income. Skew's quite Asian. Um, could do another one. Another fascinating one is uh, Red Bull. So as you'd expect, Red Bull leans extremely young, no college, and very sadly, uh, uh, people with a very, very high index to purchase Red Bull on food stamps. I don't know if that's a good thing or not. Do a few other fun ones. How do you get uh, personal data from like, their income? And yep. Yeah, no, no, good question. So uh, we, uh, we survey the users. Uh, it's part of uh, joining the application as we ask uh, shopping behavior habits and demographics. Uh, in addition, about 5 or 10% of all purchases they submit, we ask individual questions about that particular purchase and brand. So for some of these, you'll see actually we get the concrete data of here's every single item you bought. Uh, we also try and get a lay of kind of qualitative data. Um, we also try and get Facebook data now uh, to really try and kind of put together everything of what you're doing. Yeah, the, the entire app and both apps, um, they are you know, rewarded financially. Again, one, they kind of put money in their own pocket. The other is all around fundraising around a cause. Oh, yeah, marble. So I was kind of fascinated with this one. Everyone thinks New Year's resolutions. Oh, let's stop smoking. Uh, not so, not so much, right? Uh, I think everyone's sick of the holidays. It's time to light up. Uh, last one. Um, you know those commercials? New York City, the salsa, El, El Paso. Well, it turns out it's really pretty much just rich white guys that uh, <laughs> like all the El Paso. Um, local Hispanics aren't really a big fan of it. It's probably a sign it's not the best salsa. So that, that's what I have today. Um, you probably, yeah, you can get, sit through the, all this without a little bit of a recruiting pitch. So we are hiring. Come talk to me after. Uh, it's a fun team. So uh, thanks, guys. Uh, why would somebody use Mechanical Turk, like I haven't used it, versus uh, Elance or Odesk or one of those? Like, what is the price difference? Yeah, so uh, Mechanical Turk is more around a crowdsourcing platform to get like a single task done. Uh, Elance and others are more around like contracting labor. So uh, definitely higher skilled. So I need someone to design my website, mobile app, do that, right? That, that's, Elance comes into play. I need thousands of people to digitize, to do photo moderation, to do categorization, et cetera, uh, I would use Mechanical Turk. Um, the, the other players in the crowdsourcing space, well, Sama Source, uh, MobileWorks, uh, ClickWorks, uh, those are some of the others that are probably more f similar to Mechanical Turk. Um, I've got a question for John. I'm wondering where do you, uh, like what are you doing with the data? Like it's pretty interesting that uh, you know, the data you were showing about the retailers and big brands, what, what do you do with that? And then uh, uh, also, can you talk a little bit more about the financial side? Like how much does it cost you to pay the uh, mechanical turn people? Yep. Uh, an average in or, yeah. So two questions. One was, uh, what are we doing with all this data right now? And what do we plan to do with it? And the second question was uh, focused around, uh, how much do we reward the, uh, the workers? Uh, so the first question right now is, uh, we're at a point in a company where we spent the last year, year and a half, uh, getting a lot of data and understanding it and cleaning it and tagging it. Uh, so what you saw will be available kind of publicly shortly here. So it, again, it's kind of Quantcast compete for the offline world. Uh, we're doing a lot of work with the brands, uh, retailers, media agencies, and others um, who, who are very interested. It's a, it's a powerful data set, right? Uh, so it's a fun time because I think for, you know, we've been working on a year, getting a lot of data, but it's only the last few months we got to start doing fun stuff like that, figuring out what people buy and what trends are going on and, and that kind of thing. So uh, at the end of the day, it's packing it up and building out an analytics product on top of it all or, or, or sourcing the data itself through a Firehose solution. Right. Like, I was wondering if it would be cool to use your data as a developer and build something on top of it. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, it, it is something we are considering. Um, 
We have monthly hack days at our company uh, that have been awesome and it's fun because every developer wants to do it. And after the last two months, I think we're going to start opening them up to the public or even just uh, you know to come on board and uh, food all day and hack on top of our data because it's a data source that not can't really get many places. Uh, and how much do you pay the yeah. yeah, so the second question is how much do you reward the workers? Uh, so we break it down into, we try and kind of, as Martin uh, alluded to line, is break it down into the smallest tasks possible. Uh, so we pay summary transcription. Um, we already know this, the, the, the store and everything else. We just need the total and the transaction date. The OCR is not quite good enough. Uh, that's a one cent reward for us. And then on that. One cent to do one uh, receipt? No, just, just to get a few pieces of information off of it. Um, and then on the other side, um, it subs, at the end of the day, it's about sub 10 cents to try and get every item. Um, and I'll be honest, it's like for us, every use case has their own. At the end of the day, it's, it's a cost versus quality control, right? If you need 99.9% .9 accuracy, your costs are gonna be X. If you need 96%, your costs are gonna be Y. Uh, for how we use the data, um, to be candid, we can't afford 99.9%. Uh, we're very happy with 96%. Uh, as long as some of that data washes out, right? So we understand that it's um, uh, it might not attract a lot of U.S. workers. It's to be candid, just quite low for that. Uh, but that's just largely the the task that we're publishing. So I, I like the idea a lot. I'm curious what your angle is on uh, sampling bias. So I imagine like Nielsen sort of got like you're buying yep. their sampling strategy. Yeah, yeah, Nielsen, uh, well, Nielsen does a good job of communicating that they have a very uh, representative sample. Um, uh, although Stanford did a massive study on that and poked a lot of holes on it. But I, I would say this, is we do as much as we can to try and create a quote unquote mini America. Um, you're never gonna create the exact representation of America. So it actually takes a lot of stats on top of it to kind of unbias the data. Uh, effectively, not every receipt and user has the same value. Um, if we're low on Hispanics, they have to have higher value and et cetera. Um, but we, we do, we're doing a lot, and that's kind of the approach we're taking where we have two apps now. There's gonna be more apps and we're working with third parties to integrate the system to try and pull in as much rounded audience as possible. Uh, I got one more question about, the, I'm surprised that the technology isn't quite good enough to detect, because I've seen people make apps Detecting, you know, faces and all of that stuff from yeah. the phone right. and augmented reality stuff. So, how behind? How bad is it? Yeah, it's it's a good question. I think we came into it quite naive as well. Like, oh, let's do this 100% algorithmic. We need crowdsourcing. Uh, what? So, actually, at that point, the the highest accuracy we get is on the computer vision side is detecting the logos on the receipt uh, using OpenCV. Uh, where over 90% of our receipts come in, we know uh, the store off of it. That's actually not too bad. Uh, the challenge for us is on the OCR side. Uh, OCR today is a solved problem, again, for books that are scanned in without varying contrasts and angles and wrinkle text and what have you. Um, we do do a lot with OCR and have this massive regex engine on top of it to try and pull out what we can, uh, but it's not perfect. We're, we're moving, that said, we're moving, I think our approach is we're uh, we're trying to perfect some stores first, the big ones, uh, from an algorithmic standpoint, and leverage all the input we've got over uh, the last year for Mechanical Turk to build better training, OCR engine training, and, and, and algorithms. Any other questions? Uh, Jason, I don't remember which one it is, but is it a Nielsen or a Harris? And their sample size it's only 4,000 people, and they're accurate to within 4%, which is quite astounding. You're faced with a different problem where you've got a bunch of data in there you're trying to analyze and sense of how much of that data is noise and what sort of, what's the, the best approximation in terms of what you can do with data given what, you know, in the ideal scenario? What's the best that you can realistically expect to achieve? Yeah, no, I think, um, so on the 4,000 sample size, it's probably gonna be Harris Interactive. So Harris right. does surveys, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, requires a much smaller sample size. And that's a big part of our business. We survey users based on what they buy. Uh, and it requires a much smaller sample size. Um, on the Nielsen route, uh, 
They claim 100,000, they have 50,000 year over year with these barcode scanners scanning in every product. Uh, you, you can never, I mean, the biggest number one can, um, complaint from brands is it's not large enough. And the reason is, is um, yeah, to show a dashboard like we just showed, it's, it's large enough for that. Oh, I want to filter on males who are low income. How to, all of a sudden the data is insignificant by that brand. So like anything analytics wise, the number of filters and queries you do uh, cuts, your, cuts your data up really quick. And so size is critical it, it, to start answering those second layer of questions. Um, one other question? Yeah, sorry. So just yeah. What's, what's the best realistically that we can expect to achieve based on sort of semi-structured social data? Meaning that only 20% of it's useful and of that, only 25% of it can be used to generate some useful sort of you know, inferencing information. Yeah, I, I think those numbers are quite quite low. Um, there's a certain segment of our data we just throw out. Um, users are bad, they're gaming us, what have you. Uh, we have a pretty strict, def strict definition of what we call panelist, and that's a user who's been with us at least three months and upload or see it at least once a month. Um, because a lot of what we get is we want to really dive in on that household and how they purchase, repeat to purchase, uh, time between purchases, time between stores. Uh, and so we throw a lot of data out. Uh, it's, at the end of the day, it's high percentage of our data. I mean, I couldn't quote you on top of my head, 70%-ish, that is it's still very good and clean. Do you, for, for John, do you ever expose the analytics to the, to the users who are uploading receipts? They get a, yeah, that's a good question. So they get a digitized uh, version of the receipt, which, um, you know, going into it, we're like, oh, we're just gonna offer a digitized version of the receipt, and that's enough. Uh, to, for some users, that's important. Our users, though, they're in this gamified environment. They, they just wanna earn more points and coins and cash out, right? So it's not one of their highest uh, priorities is to really view and understand their expenses. We do have an app that's just focused on that. Uh, that's gonna come out in the next month or two that is really just focused around uh, managing your expenses for free. So that's again a third app that's kind of a whole different audience segment. Um, and it is kind of two different companies. We have our consumer apps where it's like different brands, different experience, different relationship, and then the, the data side of the business. Let's just do one more question. Yeah, so um, you, that, uh, you have part of the uh, data is uh, machine processed and part is crowdsourced. Uh, do you foresee uh, any tendency in the future to for one of those parties to grow or to shrink? Yeah, the, the idea is the machine process. The machine. Yeah. The yeah. 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 yeah, exactly. So um, I think somewhere's transcription right now we're at 25-30% where we can pull off the most relevant pieces off of the receipt automatically. We're not at a point where we can itemize a receipt based on current OCR without further training. Um, the grand scheme of it is, it's a hybrid of the both. We, it's a really high priority for us now to start moving towards uh, much more and more machine and algorithmic. Um, you know, as we're doing about 20,000 receipts a day, so how does this work at you know, 150, 200,000 receipts a day? Well, let's thank our speakers again.